Hi, I'm Rick Weisford. Um, I'm delighted to have you all here. I'm on the faculty of the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard. I'm also the faculty director of Making Caring Common, which puts caring and justice front and center in child raising and in our society. I am delighted to host this session on political messaging. And we have two terrific folks to guide us. Um, one is Jennifer Palmieri, who is the White House Communications Director for President Obama and the Head of Communications for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. She has also just came out, come out with a new book called She Proclaimed Declaration of Independence from a Man's World. She has clarified with me, it's not a war against men, but a declaration of independence. Um, also delighted to have here Mark McKinnon, who is communications director for both, has been a communications director for both Republican and Democratic campaigns, um, including President Bush's um, campaign, John McCain's campaign, and Richard's governor of Texas campaign. He's been a chief media advisor for five presidential campaigns. He's also a host of HBO's The Circus, which is restarting and brilliantly captures our political moment. Um, he's also been a generous friend and an advisor to Making Care in Common, so I'm delighted to have him here. And um, as usual, we have two members of our Youth Advisory Board who will be doing the interviews. I'll ask a couple of questions, but then I will turn it over to them. Um, Hannah Neal Rinville is a rising senior um, in high school in Kansas, and Lynn Gare is a rising sophomore at USC, and we are thrilled to have you both here as well. Let me just say something about the format to, for today. This is going to be a conversation. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, then I'm going to turn it over to Han Hannah Neal and Lynn Gare, who are going to have a conversation with Mark and with Jennifer for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then we will um, take questions from the audience. So um, we encourage you to, to uh, put any questions you have in the Q&A and we will try and get to as many questions as we, as we can. Um, Jennifer and, and Mark, let me, let me start with you. Um, we just had a big announcement a couple hours ago that um, uh, Joe Biden, Vice, Vice President Biden has chosen Kamala Harris as his running mate. I wondered if you could share your thoughts on this choice. Uh, and if either one of you want to start, that would be great. Go ahead, Jen. Okay. Um, so I'm, I, I'm surprised in that I've always thought it was going to be her and it never ends up being the, the begin, person at the beginning of the process rarely is the person at the end of the process that gets picked. Um, and it's pretty telling, I think, that um, Biden did up, end up with her, which is that I think he had two big things on his mind. One... What does it need to? What does he need to do to win? And two, who is really ready to step up and be president on day one? I know Biden is somebody who wanted a partner, and um, wanted somebody that he felt close, personally close to, could be a close advisor. The kind of relationship that he had with President Obama, and he is very personally close to Susan Rice. He worked with her a lot um, during Obama, uh, really likes her, and the fact that he went with somebody who he doesn't know as well, and you know, someone that he uh, tumbled with on the campaign trail, but I think that he probably con concluded rightfully that she's best prepared to do the job and she's probably best prepared um, to you know, represent and help this ticket. Uh, well, I'm not surprised that that's the pick, even though Jen's right, it rarely is the person at the beginning who ends up at the end. It's a, it's a, it's a really brutal process to survive. But from the very beginning, to me, it, it's like looking at a racing form and you're looking at the horses and you kind of check the things that are the advantage for that particular candidate. And she just checked nine out of 10 boxes, woman, woman of color, been on the national stage before, which I, which I thought was super important and which was an eliminating factor for a lot of the other candidates. Um, this is, as, as, as well as, as Harris and Biden are about to find out, she's going to be assaulted. And it's already begun. The, the, Trump has already put out an ad uh, attacking her viciously. And uh, so, but, but she's been there and she's a fighter and she, and she knows the drill. So uh, my, my, my view on the Biden pick was that he should row the boat, not rock it. And I think he's wrote it really well with this pick. Yeah. Mark, just a quick question for you on, on, on this. When you say it's a brutal process, do you mean the process of vetting the candidates is a brutal process? Yeah. I mean, obviously, be, being the pick is brutal, but the process is too. 
I mean, you know, it's uh, the congresswoman from California uh, got really roughed up uh, to this process. Uh, and, you know, it, it exposes everything that's ever been in your life and your record and your family. And it's, it's a painful uh, it's a painful thing to go through, sure. Yeah, you know, Rick, when I did, uh, I was part of, at the end of the process for when I worked for Hillary Clinton, uh, when, when they narrowed down to three choices, I was, as a communications director, I was presented with the binders on each of the choices, right? And the binders are like this big, and there's maybe three per candidate, and it's everything that they could find out about this person from personal details and family history to financial records, just like everything. Um, and if you're not used to, and very few people are, there's a handful of people on the planet that are used to being under that kind of scrutiny. It's like, it is brutal. Yeah, yeah it's rough. Yeah, great. All right, we could talk about this for a long time, but, but, but let's move on because we want to get to the topic of political messaging. Um, if one of you could just clarify for us um, what political messaging is, or what do you mean by messaging, and what do you mean by messaging in the context of a campaign? MCAT, you do that first. Sure. Well, um, there's a lot of discussion in campaigns about mobilizing voters, uh, voter contact, uh, 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 raising money, fundraising, mobilization, but all of that is, is really meaningless unless there's a clear, compelling message from the campaign and the candidacy. And what I mean by that is it's, it's not complicated, but, it, but it's often overlooked and, and not, not often well understood by campaigns and candidates that when we talk about message, we're talking about a, a candidate's rationale. What is their rationale for running? Why are they running for office? Now, Donald Trump is a great example of a really clear message right? And whether you agreed with him or not, in 2016, he came out, in fact, in 2012, he copyrighted the phrase, make America great again, uh, because he, th he thought, and he was right, it was a very clear message about why he was running. And again, you may agree with it or not, but nobody misunderstood that. Uh, so, uh, and interestingly, uh, this time around, when asked why he's running for a second term, and he's been asked a bunch of different times, uh, most famously, the first time by Sean Hannity on Fox, why he wanted a second term, and he doesn't have an answer. He doesn't have a clear, compelling rationale or message for why he wants a second term, and that's highly problematic. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. You want to add anything here? I, the only thing I would add is that what you know what Trump managed to do is he had a slogan and a message. I think a lot of times people mistake message for slogans, um, and Make America Great Again managed to be both and that it was, you know, it is something that sticks uh, as you want a slogan to be, but it, it conveys a bigger thing. I mean, I think it conveys, you know, I happen to think it conveys, a, a, you know, Make America Great Again suggests you're going backwards to, uh, you know, for people in America that had felt disaffected uh, by all of the changes in America going back to something to the way that it, you know, that it, that it used to be. That's a new thing that retro messaging um, and presidential campaigns, you normally want to be future oriented. But what's interesting about what he managed to do is it's both the message and a slogan. Great. All right. Great. Well, thank you. I'm going to turn this over to Hannah Neal and Linger. Thank you. So both of you seem uh, just passionate about the work that you do, motivated or incentivized you to get involved in this work, specifically on the presidential level. McKinnon, you got quite a story. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the, uh, this, I just was confirmed with a, f a friend of mine yesterday who's running the Lincoln Project, which is, a, is an effort by former Republicans to help defeat Donald Trump. And the person running that is an old uh, friend of mine. She used to work for Condi Rice, and she has exactly the same story that I have, and so many other people do, who are work in politics. Which is, there was, there's no like, you know, sort of classic textbook route into politics, uh, which is both a good thing, but also a confounding thing for a lot of people. But it's, it's not like you're going to work at a corporation and you get your MBA or your PhD and you go as a junior partner, you work there for 10 years. Politics, you don't need a license or a degree, campaigns anyway, and uh, which was a good thing for me since I didn't have either. They're not <laughs> regulated, uh, but they're hungry for passionate, talented people. 
Uh, and it's not that campaigns, a lot of campaigns have lots of people show up, especially a presidential campaign. But, uh, but there's a lot of people that are, you know, that are, that are there and they're there because, you know, for a variety of reasons, but they're not that passionate or they're not that talented. And the people who are both passionate and talented and willing to work their ass off get recognized very quickly. And, you know, I call campaigns true meritocracies because what happens is what happened to me and happened to a lot of other people I know is I just say, go show up, you know, do you, you know, go work for free, go be an intern, do whatever, be a volunteer. I was a volunteer at first. I volunteered and after a month or two, there was a job posting to do computer input for five bucks an hour, which was a lot of money to me. I did that for a while. And then, you know, a month later, somebody came back and said, oh, he used to work on the college newspaper. You should be doing press. Next thing you know, I'm doing press. And, you know, the next thing I know, I'm the press secretary for the campaign. And, you know, we lose the campaign. The next thing I know, I'm press secretary, press secretary for the governor of Texas. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a place in which you can, uh, uh, you can really move up the ladder quickly and, uh, and, and really have a lifetime of, of experience and great friendships like Jen Palmieri. Yay. Um, I come from a military family, uh, three generations Navy. And so big public service in my background. I always knew that, you know, and I saw my uh, family have very fulfilling careers through that kind of work. Um, but I just knew government was for me. I've uh, early on from, I was fascinated by Watergate weirdly when I was in first grade. <laughs> and uh yeah, and, and, and I mean, from that moment on, I just always knew I wanted to find a way to be in politics. I never thought that I would run for office. Um, and this is a bad thing, because I probably should have thought that I would run for office. But um, I didn't, I, I mean, I moved around a lot. I didn't feel like I really had a home. I was a woman. I didn't see a lot of women doing that. Um, but I wanted to get in somehow. And I didn't know what the path would be. But I started working for my congressman um, when I was in college and I was just really lucky because it was Leon Panetta who um, is from California. He became Bill Clinton's chief of staff. He became Barack Obama's CIA director and secretary of defense. So um, I found, I never expected to be at the presidential campaign level, um, but that was my path there. Mark is totally right. Um, campaigns are a meritocracy. I mean, it's hard. Uh, you know, uh, a good thing about campaigns and politics that's changing now is that you're not expected to work for free because that does box so many people out of opportunity. Um, and I think uh, campaigns really try to pay, uh, uh, you know, the, pay young people so that they, they're not in that position and everybody can have the opportunity. But if you can do it, anything from city council to the state legislature to presidential campaign, uh, it's, uh, it's, you, you'll be, uh, it's remarkable how quickly you get a lot of responsibility and just the best people. That's why I like it. Smart, you know, motivated people that want to make a difference in the world. I can't imagine doing something just like in the private sector. Like, just 53 years old, never done it. I suppose I never will. <laughs> <laughs> So um, both of you have, both of you are communication strategists. So what exactly would you define a message as and why is it important? Mark, you should go. Well, um, uh, I'll, I'll go back to um, the issue that uh, what I mentioned off the top, which is that a message is a rationale. It's 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 why you're running. It's it, and it, this is this is true for everything in life, really. I mean, it's not just politics. It's whatever you're doing, uh, you know, or what, whatever. You know, you may be working for a nonprofit. You may be working for a corporation. You may be working for a politician. But you know, successful companies, successful nonprofits, successful campaigns all have clear and compelling messages. And and you know what that means is you have something that is relevant and important and compelling to your audience or your consumers or whoever it might be. So, you know, in politics, we do it. We do a ton of research. If somebody's running for an office they say, great, I want to, you know, I want to be a Senator or Congressman. I'm say, okay, good. And we, we talk to them and say, why do you want to, why do you want to, why do you want to be a Congressman? You know, hopefully they have some idea about that. And as, as, as campaign workers, Jen, and I spend a lot of time with candidates talking through that. And they'll have ideas and thoughts about why they want to run. We kind of, kind of help sharpen that because a lot of times candidates are really smart people. 
uh, you know, but they're not often, but they're not always good communicators. And it's not enough in the modern era to be smart or experienced. Uh, you have to be a good communicator to be successful. And a lot of people are resistant to that. They're like, oh, I don't want to, you know, that's, that's <laughs> dumbing stuff down, you know? Yeah, I don't want to be programmed, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, I don't, yes, exactly. But, but in order to be successful in the, in the modern era uh, uh, that we live in, you have to be a super sharp, focused communicator. And that means coming up with a clear, compelling message. And, and you know, we do a lot of research and campaigns to find out what voters are, uh, you know, are the, what they're thinking about, what they're concerned about. Now, it has to line up. You can't just make stuff up. Uh, I mean, you can try, uh, but it's, you're going to be more successful if what you're articulating has something to do with your life, your experience, you know, what you've worked on before. Uh, it somehow lines up, the things that you're articulating and the messages you're communicating line up with who you are and what you've lived. And Mark, I would say like McKinnon is particularly good at this, um, by the way. I mean, he's particularly good in a, in a, in a campaign to say to stay, uh, to not get too dragged down into um, minutia and day to day and remind people, no, this is what we're about, right? Remember, we're always driving this point home. Uh, honestly, Republicans are often better at this than Democrats. I think that is because on the Democratic side, um, we are very motivated by policy and specifics of what we want to change. And we can get, uh, uh, we go you know, down rabbit holes on, on that. And um, um, that, can be, that can be distracting. I do think that the best message though, whether it's from a candidate or, um, you know, or if it's you know, a company or, um, you know, whatever the sort of institution is, it just has to be so true to the, either the founder or the candidate or whatever is at that person's core, who's the, the, the key part of the institution. Because, uh, you know, the best work I've done in communications is never telling a candidate, here's what your message should be, or telling a candidate, here are your talking points. It's listening to them, understanding what motivates them to be in the race, um, and then saying to them, of the things you say, here's the best distillation. This is you at your best. This is you at your core. And you just keep whittling that away, whittling that away, and you'll eventually get to that sentence that you know that this is um, what you're about. But you can't, it is not, it rarely works to force that on a candidate, it has to come from them. And Neil. Yeah, so I think that's very interesting. Um, working as a communica uh, communication strategist, has there ever been moments for either of you where uh, you disagreed with either former President Barack Obama or George Bush on their message and how they were getting that out there commu with uh, communicating their messages? Uh, yes, is the answer. I'll answer that a couple of different ways. Uh, one is that uh, there was a time in my life when I was working in politics where my, my, my filter for determining who I would work for was, you know, sort of a list of issues. And I'd sort of line that up with a candidate I wanted to work for. And if I agreed on nine out of 10, then that was a good candidate for me to consider if they were willing to consider me. And I, I kind of worked that way for a while. And then I realized that, you know, often candidates who I might have lined up with perfectly turned out to be horrible human beings. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that often, you know, there, there be, I later came to work for candidates who I didn't agree with on everything, but most, you know, most of the sort of important big items, yes, philosophically in line with them. But to me, it was really important that their life experience, that they had life experience uh, and that they had that they had character, that they had you know good values, and and the sort of things that that I care about uh, became really important as well. So so the answer is yeah. I went to work. For, I worked for people who I didn't always agree with. Uh, I would always let them know uh, in no uncertain terms if I disagreed, and then I'd shut the hell up. You know, I never said anything publicly about my disagreements. That was part of the deal. You know, I worked for them, and uh, you know I had my say. But after I had my say, they're the boss. I don't remember a specific time in working for Obama where I disagreed. I mean, there, there may have been, there were times, certain times in communication strategy when I had, um, because, you know, I was like, 
very aggressive and it was like, let's get out there. Let's communicate this message. Let's do more interviews. Let's do more interaction. And sometimes he thought it was better to, you know, wait, hang back, um, sort of live through tumult um, and wait for something to pass than to constantly be engaging. So there were tactical moments where I felt like I disagreed with him, but I don't, but not on, not on big stuff. I do agree with Mark that you know, it, it really matters about the, the, the character of the person that you're working for as opposed to some kind of composite list of issues. You know, these are humans. Um, it's a very human endeavor. It's really hard. Presidential campaigns, being president, uh, really, uh, you know, it just, it just reveals everything about you. Um, and you better pick somebody that you feel is a good person at their core to work with. So uh, what would you guys say is the most or least gratifying part of your job? Least gratifying is dealing with cranky candidates who are upset about a bad story. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, one thing, I, this is one thing that was really great about working for Obama, because I didn't start working for him until 2011. And that by that point, he had developed not necessarily a thick skin, but a perspective that there were times that the way the press corps is sort of set up, it's, um, you know, there's somewhat, I don't want to overstate this, but somewhat antagonistic relationship, right? You are the person to be covered. They are the people who are covering you. And there are times where you're just you know, in a slump and everything you do is going to be wrong. And no matter, and the thing with the working in the White House in particular is uh, you have all these bad, usually by the time a problem comes to a president's desk, there's only bad options left, right? Because it could have been solved. If, it were, if there was an easy answer, it would have been solved somewhere else. Um, and no matter what you, no matter what the president does, the questions will all be, well, why didn't you do, you did X, why didn't you do Y, right? It's just like set up that way. And um, explaining, dealing with candidates um, that uh, are upset about like coverage is really tiresome. And um, uh, you know, with the, by the time I got to Obama, that we would joke, we'd say, just because a story appears in the press and it's bad, doesn't make it a press problem, right? It's just like a problem. It gets aired in the press. <laughs> doesn't make it a communications problem for me to solve. It's a actual problem um and then i've done a little bit you know uh i've done with a lot of really tough personal stuff um with the clintons obviously uh monica Lewinsky was my intern during the clinton white house and i lived through um clinton impeachment um i worked for uh, former presidential candidate john edwards and when he had an extramarital affair baby out of wedlock wife very close to um dying of cancer, like just wretched, wretched stuff. And uh, you hurt so much for the people that you're working for and trying to shield them. And at the same time, dealing with really intrusive, tough press questions. It is, I mean, some of the most wrenching days of, um, of my life. But the rewarding part is feeling like you're part of something that matters. And I just, you know, there's small moments of that and there's big moments of that. You know, I, I'm... Uh, I can have pride about the losing campaigns as much as the ones that we won. So as you felt like you really g gave it your best shot and like did the best you could for your candidate. Yeah. I, I, one of the things I was going to say is that I, I, I always learn more from uh, losing campaigns than winning campaigns uh, because I sure as hell didn't want to lose it ever again. It's a horrible, horrible experience when you put your heart and soul into it. But, but winning is amazing. I mean, when you you know pour your heart and soul into a two-year effort or something like that, and kind of live and breathe with your coworkers and the candidates, and and then if you win a race, and then if you win a presidential election, that's like the Super Bowl. And there's so that's an incredible experience and reward. Uh, the hard part, as Jen said, is just often you're working with candidates who don't really understand the press, except for the fact that they want good press, and if it's bad press, it's your fault. <laughs> totally. Uh, Totally. So, I remember, and here's, a, here's, a, here's just an example of what it's like. So I worked for a governor of Texas who was very creative about how he reported his finances. And the only people, I mean, he had like three different committees and there's some pyramid scheme. It was legal, but it was complicated. And the only people that understood it were him and the treasurer. 
So every, every quarter you have to file your finances and I would be the person on point to have to answer the questions. And inevitably I couldn't understand what was going on. So a report was coming up and I knew it was going to be a complicated one. I asked the treasurer uh, to please be around and available that day to answer any questions uh, that I couldn't answer. Sure enough, the day comes and he's in South America and can't get a hold of him. Press is hammering at my door. They're all on deadline. And the only thing I can think to say is, quote, it's not as bad as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, was the lead quote in the story. And the governor who, yeah, who would, uh, cl like clockwork, read hit the morning papers at exactly 6 a.m. My phone rang at 6.01 and I knew who it was going to be. And I answered the phone. Sure enough, it was him. And he was just screaming at me. And what he said was pretty funny, though. He said, McKinnon, damn it. I can get people to say that about me for free. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have to pay for that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's always your fault. It's tough. That part is, that part is rough. Yeah. And, yeah, I think we have time for one more question. I just want to encourage the folks in the audience, folks who are participating to um, to insert their questions in the Q&A too. Go ahead, Han, Neil. So kind of keeping the spirit of the most and least gratifying part of your, of your job, um, is there one success and one failure that really stands out to you that's really ingrained in your memory? I mean, I worked for Hillary Clinton in 2016, right? So it's hard to say that, it's hard to think of anything that I can't, I can't get, you know, move past that. Um, uh, what was incredibly frustrating um, on that uh, campaign was not being able to get beyond the email story, right? And I've literally written two books about this now. Um, and what I think was, is there was, um, you know, there's this myth that Hillary didn't answer questions about emails. It's a myth. Uh, she answered dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds even of questions about emails. The problem was people were not satisfied with the answers because I think what that was really about when you get to the root of it is that people thought she was hiding something, right? Um, and that is, that's some, that's a, we have questions about her motivations. We're suspicious about that. I think that's true for women that are kind of, stepping outside of the roles that women normally play. And it seems like that may seem out, my comments may seem out of date given it was 2016, now we're in 2020. But what I've come to learn is that when you look, look at the scope of human history, women seeking power is still a very big deal. And the problem for Hillary is that for her whole adult life, she was always stepping outside of the role that women normally played from when she was a college student to when she was first lady, senator, presidential candidate. And so for 40 years, there had been something sort of vexing about her and that got translated into you'd hear about her things like there's something about her I just don't like, right? I don't know. There's just something about her I just don't like. There's something about her I just don't trust. And I think that it, it doesn't mean that everybody who doesn't like her is sexist. It's just that we have these inherent biases and models in our head of what women are supposed to do and not do. And she was always <laughs> confounding them. And the fact that in real time, we couldn't figure out a way to convey who she really was. Um, I think the Hulu documentary that was done about her does the best job of showing who Hillary Clinton really was. But, you know, that will, you know, to my death will remain the most uh, vexing thing. Still, I'm so... Um, so proud of that effort, so part of, proud to have been part of that team. That sort of, first of all, try to stop Trump, who I thought was like super dangerous, um, but also tried really hard for that first woman and sort of revealed to me, and I think to a lot of people in the country, wow, all these, all the work that's still left to be done, for gender equality, racial equality, part of this moment that we're in now, I'm really proud of having been part of that work. Um, so, I mean, the, the Bush campaign uh, 2000 was, you know, as thrilling and exciting as it gets, uh, way too thrilling and way too exciting, really, as we that bounced into a, a, a runoff, a recount, which actually kind of dampened the, the, the uh, celebra uh, celebration in a big way, obviously, uh, and extended for uh, a month or two until I got figured out. But, but that was, uh, 
you know, to, to work that long and that hard. I started working for Bush when he was governor and just to kind of be on part of that train all that time with really good people, including him was a, a terrific reward. Um, I, you know, it was, I, I, I was both disappointed uh, about McCain because I, I loved McCain and I worked for him in the primary. I had this very weird thing, uh, an agreement with him that I would help him try and get the nomination to be president. But I said way back in 2017 that if Barack Obama was the nominee for Democrats, I didn't want to work against Obama because I thought his candidacy would be good for the country, even though I would still support McCain. Uh, and then that happened, which was weird, and McCain had forgotten about it, but I'd written a memo to the file of the senior staff about it. So I had to go in and say, hey, Senator, congratulations. And by the way, I got to cut out for the general election. And he was typically McCain, kicked my ass at first and then gave me a big hug and said he loved me. And thanked me for getting him there and said it'd be very un McCain like not to keep my word. But it was just, it was sad to see. I was, I listen, Obama's victory was, uh, I thought part of the reason I didn't want to attack him was I thought his candidacy was good for the country. And I thought he was a good, I thought he ended up being a good president, but it was hard to see McC McCain lose just because he'd been through so much in his life mm -hmm. and sacrificed so much for so many people. And he, I mean, he really was a genuine American hero. So that was tough to see him, you know, really slogged through all that. And, you know, and he thought he was going to win till the very end, even though uh, it was pretty clear the cards weren't in it for him. But, uh, but that was rough to see, see that old fighter kind of go down. Thank you both very much. I really appreciate um, those, those thoughts. Um, we got we have a bunch of questions that are coming in. So I thought we would turn to the Q and A. Um, uh, I may have missed this. I'm, I'm quoting here. I may have missed this, but what should we be hearing from Biden, in your opinion, that we need to hear and are not? I mean, I think part of this is what kind of messaging should we be getting from Biden now? Jen, go ahead. Yep. Um, I'm just looking at him with his new, new, uh, new um, running mate. Um, I think that, you know, his, you know, what, what's Biden's message, right? What's his core message? His core message is to return the country to normal, right? Like that is his, that is his core message. Um, and I think that it's a case where him not, him not having to engage every day has been fine to now, right? Being in the basement, as they say, um, that's worked out because, you know, partly because we've, you know, uh, because of COVID, because of, uh, you know, because of how badly Trump has handled the racial reckoning in the country. Um, but we have about 90, a little less than 90 days to go, and he's got a running mate. And I think you want to be, you need to be articulating a, uh, a path forward beyond just this is going back. Like, we, I want to return the country to normal. And I think that you can, um, you know, he made a switch that I thought was really needed towards the end of the primary because he used to say basically it's like go back to the way things were and it has to be better than it was before, right? Because for a lot of people in America, particularly people of color, it was not that great in America before. And so to say, I think you can take the, uh, you know, COVID has, has revealed so many broken systems in America and you can use that as a jumping off point for how you're going to not just not restore things, but grow and make things better. And with him and Kamala Harris now, they need to be doing that on a regular basis, you know, new policy, people will roll their eyes and say policy is boring. Policy is, it's got to be backed up, backed up by a message, but policy is uh, Democrats bread and butter because we're trying to fix problems. And that's how we get elected. Democrats get elected to fix problems. Um, and I think you also, they also want to be doing that because you got to, you can't be sitting ducks for Donald Trump. So it's been okay to be to like sort of stay out of the way uh, to this date, but for the last two months of the campaign, they got to be on the um, on the offense, and you got to be saying how you're going to make things better. So, um, you know, there was a lot of criticism early on about Biden being in the basement, but it actually has worked very well for him, <laughs> and uh, that goes to an old adage: you know, if somebody's digging a ditch, let him keep digging. Um, and the other adage is don't catch a falling knife, right? So uh, the, but, but as Jen said, really Biden's kind of core message, and actually I was just reading Howard uh, Feynman, who's an old reporter, friend of ours, 
uh, just wrote, wrote uh, just uh, tweeted something about, he said he'd been reviewing all the Biden articles for last year. So he said the one word that appears more than anything is decency, which is a, a, an interesting and, and uh, you know, compelling idea given the time we're in and, and what he's running against. And it reminds me a lot of our campaign in, two, in 2000 because um, very often presidential elections, unless there's a crisis or a war, are about the economy. And if the economy is in pretty good shape, people are generally inclined to keep the baton with the party in power that is responsible for that economy. And that was the case in 1999. The economy is in pretty good shape. Bill Clinton's done a good job. And we're running against Al Gore. And so people felt good about the economy. Most of the issues they cared about, they lined up with Al Gore and not George Bush. But, uh, but, but so we, this is one we really had to thread the needle on. And uh, G- George Bush just viscerally re- reacted to uh, President Clinton and Jen Palmieri's former intern uh, uh, and all that. And so the message that he started to communicate was that he wanted to restore honor and dignity to the White House. And sort of saying, you know, this era of personal irresponsibility has gone too far. We need more kind of discipline in our culture and more personal responsibility. And that worked. Uh, And and so Biden has actually echoed a lot of that same kind of message. In fact, he said specifically about returning honor and dignity. And, that you know, so it's it's echoes of 2000. But, you know, it worked then. I think it's even way more powerful now, given the person is running against. Uh, so, uh, but to, to Jen's point, I mean, he's, he's got to be, he's got to look forward and there's got to, you know, he's got to articulate a vision for the future. And that's particularly true now when people are so scared about what the future looks like. Yeah. You got to Like people just, people don't know where we're going. Yeah. You know, they just really don't know where we're going. And I think he's got to say, this is where, you know, and, and I think people are patient about how long it's going to take to get there. You know, they understand that we have a lot of broken things that are gonna, not going to get fixed overnight, but you got to be like, this is, this is where we're headed. So I think we have time for one more question. I just also want to mention, we just did a national survey of American values, um, gave people a choice of about 12 values. And the three values there seemed to be consensus on across the political parties were honesty, decency, and justice. I think justice has been activated by this moment. But Biden may have made a very good choice in picking decency as a something to put front and center in his campaign. Um, I, we have, oh, I'm sorry, we only have time for one more question, but the question is, what, have, what have, have been your experiences of dealing with blatant oppressive behavior toward candidates, sexism, racism, xenophobia? How did you approach those situations? And Jennifer, I am sure you've dealt with it many times. I'll just kick this one to Jennifer. Jennifer take it yeah, away. I mean, I dealt with it one, you know, just, uh, I mean, I dealt with it with Obama, right, with the birth certificate, which, by the way, just in case anybody forgot, that was Donald Trump leaving the charge on the birth certificate. Um, and um, and then with Hillary, obviously. So the the blatant xenophobia, racism with, Obama, it was, you know, he, in the beginning, in eight, he was very, you know, he didn't talk about race a lot. It was just like his persona spoke for, uh, for it. Um, And he was always, and as president, he was always very aware that he was president of all of America, right? Um, And had a reluctance to speak about race, reluctance to engage on the birth certificate. And then it was like, you know, around 2011, 12, like it's when media and the way Americans got news really started to to disassemble and and, and get into silos. And we realized you can't just let something like the birth certificate go unanswered and uh we did answer it in a more forceful way with like tracking it down and finding it you know whereas back in the day you would have just ignored something like that um but what it spoke to was something bigger which was people were uneasy with all the demographic changes in america and there were silos that were forming within the country of people like you know kind of facing off into different groups and getting reinforced with the kind of information that they wanted to hear um, about who Obama really was. And that was the same um, problems that we ran into with Hillary. And, 
you know, was twofold with Hillary. One is the, you know, the things that I seen as, as sort of like gendered, uh, biased, coveraged. Again, like I want to be clear, it's not that everybody is sexist and people, I don't feel like men in America are trying to hold pe women back, but still even with men as uh, good partners, women aren't rising, right? There's something else happening here. There are deep seated biases in everybody's head. There are systems that block all women, all people of color from getting real power. And what I found with Hillary was hard to call that out in real time because it looked like we were just crying sexism because um, they would say, well, people haven't liked Hillary for decades, right? That's your fault that people don't like Hillary for, <laughs> haven't liked Hillary for decades. And as opposed to thinking, wow, what happened to this woman along the way over the last few decades that all this stuff piled up on her and there's nothing at the root of it. She didn't actually do anything wrong in white water, right? She didn't actually do anything. Wrong. So it's just like, we're being, we're suspicious of her. But then what we found in trying to beat this stuff back, both on the xenophobic side and in the um, and on the sexist stuff is it was too late. People in America were walled off. And, you know, it's not like we didn't see what was happening. It's not like we didn't try to talk to white voters in Western Pennsylvania about her and with an economic message, people that were disaffected had lost work, lost hope in America, starting to turn against, um, you know, the notion of an open, an open uh, American and having bad feelings about immigration. But they, they were gone, you know, they, they couldn't hear her. Um, they literally could not hear her. They had their Fox News cacophony and what they wanted to see on Facebook. And that was when I just, you felt so hopeless, helpless. Uh, I don't, there wasn't, there were not the means to beat this back. And that is why in my own life, I choose to live in places where there are a lot of Trump supporters. And in my own life, I make it a huge priority to go out and hire and like not be, not hire people that look like me, but hire people who don't and hire people that have different views than me. At, Cause like we have got to break this, these silos down. Um, xenophobia, racism, sexism, these things do not get extinguished in America. We can manage them and try to keep them at bay. Um, or we can get consumed by them. You know, that's really like the moment that we're in now is, is which way is that gonna go? Well, um, we, are, we are over time, I'm sorry to say, but that was a wonderful final thought takeaway. Mark, do you have any final take, quick takeaways, final thoughts for these folks? Oh, I, I, I can't add to that great answer that Jennifer just offered for that, but I would just say for the people who are on the call who are interested in public policy, uh, or politics, that it's a it's a great place to go. It's uh, you know I've I loved um, the chapters of the book of my life that have been in politics, which is most of them, and it's it's been you know a time frustrating for you to do this to explore that avenue, and and we need you. You know we really you know yeah. we really need you. So kick it hard, carry on regardless. <laughs> sure. Terrific. Thank you both so much. This has been um, very helpful, inspiring, interesting, and really appreciate it. And uh, everyone out there, be well, take care, make sure to vote, make sure to register your friends to yeah. vote. Don't stop. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. See you. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Bye.